This is what the Almighty, I'm reading out the NIV translation. This is what the Almighty God says. These people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. Wow. It ain't time to build God's house, they said. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains in ruins? Now, this is what the Lord God says. Give careful attention and give a thought to your ways. You have planted much, but you've harvested little. You eat, but you are never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You put on clothes, but you are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. Wow. Wowee. This is what the Lord God Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build my house. I'm going to say that again. Go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build my house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored. My subject is going to be around verse 8, right? Where it says, go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build my house. I'm going to be teaching all month on faithfulness brings fruitfulness. I'm going to be showing you how your faithfulness is connected to your fruitfulness and that your next blessing is tied to your obedience. You're not going to talk to me this morning. And I'm trying to hold my mule and not run down the aisle because I want to make sure that I'm articulating what God says. And so this is what I want you to shout from the top of your lungs, what God said, build my house. Say it again. Build my, say it again. Build my, one more time. Build my house. Clap your hands and give God praise. Why don't you? Father, in a few moments I have, use me to your glory in Jesus name. Amen. Please be seated. Build my house. E.M. Gray, in his essay entitled The Common Denominator of Success, observed that the one common characteristic that successful people have in common is their ability to prioritize. That that one trait, their ability to prioritize things in their life, that that one trait was even more important than hard work, than education, or even good connections. Prioritize. The ability to recognize, categorize, prioritize, and here it is, put first things first. To look at your life and decide what things need to be addressed and what order to put them in. Now, as Christians, you know that the word of God constantly reminds us of the importance of putting God first. The Bible says this in Matthew 6 and 33. Six, seek ye first the kingdom first. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And all these things, these things shall be added unto you. He wasn't saying that these things don't matter, but they have to be placed in their proper order. That you have to place them in their order of priority. You have to place them in a place where it's God first and everything else second. Amen. That is God over everything. I know this is old school and I know we don't talk about it much anymore. We want to talk about things first. Come on, come on. And it's almost out of style, Brother, Mark, Brother Michael, to be talking about putting God first. But we understand that putting God first positions us to receive things. Y'all not going to talk to me. And that's true in every area of our life. It's imperative that we make our relationship with God our number one priority and the focus of our lives. Right. Proverbs 3 and 6 says this. Acknowledge him, acknowledge God in all your ways, and then he shall direct your paths. Here's the issue with us. God says, I want to be included. I want to be first. I want to be included in your decision making. What we typically do is we choose a path. First, 
And then we want God to bless the path that we've chosen. And I want to say, Susan, write this down. God is not obligated to support anything that he was not first consulted on. Y'all not going to talk to me. You go and get who you want. You go where you want. You do what you want. You go after what you want. And then you want God to bless it after you have chosen it. And God said, I want you to have enough respect for me to at least consult me before you make that decision. While you're thinking about it, while you're considering it, while you're considering who you're going to marry, while you're considering where you're going to live, while you're considering the job that you're going to take, while you're considering the business that you're starting, I want you to get in the habit of spending some time with me in consultation and asking me what my thoughts are put your plans out before me and let me look at it and be able to put my input on it and don't get mad at me because I haven't blessed your mess because I'm not obligated to bless anything that you have not first talked to me about oh it's gonna get tough in here now 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 I know I hear people saying right now well God I always put God first really I always put God before in front of everything. Sometimes what we do, what we say with our mouths is not true with our lives. Making God a priority is more than just giving God lip service. It's more than, you know what lip service is. Lip service is when, when, when what you say doesn't match what you do. Lip service is when you're, you're writing a check with your mouth that, Lip service is when you're telling him all the good things, the good things, the platitudes, the honor. You know, it kind of reminds me of those rappers, you know how they do at the award ceremony. Yeah, they, they done shot people, stab people, drank everything, slept with everybody, and they get an award and they kiss up and say, thank you, God, for the strength. Really? Your, your, <laughs> your words are not consistent with your actions. Watch people whose actions do not match their words. Watch people whose actions do not watch do match their words. God's actions are always consistent with his words. That's why I love him. God is never in disagreement. Whatever God says is always consistent with what he does. And whatever God does is always consistent with what he says. He's trying to teach his children to be the same way. Because even as believers of God, we sometimes say things that we don't mean. God is never in disagreement with himself. There are three that bear record in heaven. There is the Father, there is the Word, and there is the Holy Spirit. And these three things are one. They are never in disagreement. They're never in an argument. They're never divided on an issue. Whatever God the Father says, the Son is in agreement, and the Holy Spirit carries it out. There is no disagreement. But with us being human beings, oftentimes what we say and what we do are two different things. Oh, yeah, we, we, we practice double speech. We're double minded. And the Bible said that a double minded man is unstable in all of his ways. Hmm. I'm a weird kind of person. I, I live in a world of words and I tend to take words seriously. If you say something to me, I believe you. Yeah, and, and I'm a weird person. My, my love language is words of affirmation. If you say you love me, I really believe you. I, but the problem becomes that sometimes when people say things, they don't say what they mean or what they mean doesn't mean the same thing. We speak in double entendre. We, we're saying the same thing, but it has a different meaning. I have some associates of mine that confuse me. They frustrate me because whatever they say is not always exactly what they mean. And I get frustrated because if you say something to me, I think you mean it. If you say you don't like me, I believe you and I leave you alone. I won't bother you. I believe what you say, right? You know you better than me. But if you say you love me, I think I, I believe that you do into it. If you say you're going to show up, if you say you're going to be there, I believe what you say, right? And when your actions don't match your words, I start backing away from you because I'm confused about you. This, this, this double speech that we have in church, this double entendre where we say something but we don't mean something. Sometimes we're saying something but we're not on the same page. And so sometimes when people say something to me, I say, let's unpack that. Let's unpack that. You said you, you said something, you love me. Let's unpack that because I want to make sure that we're saying the same thing. 
Sometimes what we're saying is lost in translation. Jesus had the same problem with Peter. Peter, do you love me? Yes, I love you. Peter, do you love me? Yes, I love you. Peter, do you love me? Yes, I love you. And this whole correspondence ensued between Jesus and his disciple because they were saying the same word, but it had a different meaning. See, when you read it in English, it's just love. But in the Greek language, Jesus was saying, do you agape me? Do you love me with God love? And Peter was saying, I phileo you, which is brotherly love, where we get the word Philadelphia. So it was like, do you agape me? Yes, I phileo you. Do you agape me? Yes, I phileo you. And this whole conversation was being construed because they were using the same word, but it had a different meaning. And so sometimes, sometimes what we're saying with our actions is not consistent with what we're saying with our words. Let me prove it. In Isaiah 20 and 13, God said, these people draw nigh to me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They're saying all the right stuff. They give me all the platitudes, but their heart, their action does not reflect the word that's coming out of their mouth. And you have to watch people whose words are not consistent with their actions. And our inability to sift through and be decisive is making it difficult for us to move into the blessings of God. Even when it comes to your prayer, you confuse God. Your double-mindedness makes it difficult for him to bless you like he wants to. Because when you pray, you're not, you're, you're not consistent. You're not clear about what you're praying about. I want this, then I want that, then I want this, then I want that. And God says, you know what? Call me when you make up your mind. Heaven is behind you. Heaven is prepared to bless you. I'm prepared to bless whatever it is that you want. But your inability to decide what you really want is hindering your ability to receive the blessing of God. It's not God's fault. God is saying, make up your mind. Look at somebody say, make up your mind. Make up your mind. Your relationships are being affected because you can't make up your mind. You can't make up your mind who you want, who you want to be with. Oh, Lord, I'm going to... That's why having an affair and cheating on somebody is not as good as you think it is. You think they're having their cake and eating it too. You think they're living a good life. You think they're having the best of both worlds. But can I tell you they're really not. Because there's an old saying that says when a lion chases two rabbits, he ends up being hungry. Can I say it again? If a lion is chasing two rabbits, he ends up being hungry. He don't get the best of either one. He doesn't catch either one. He's expending energy trying to figure out, do I want her? Do I want her? Do I want him? Do I want him? And you can't get the best of either one. You're not getting the energy of either one. And so you are frustrated because you are divided in your intentions. Action speaks louder than words. Make up your mind. I found this out about people. I found, I found that people, people make time for things that they want. That's what I found out. I'm, I'm a person of words. If you say something to me, I think you do it, and I'll be frustrated if you don't keep your word. And I'm not perfect either. I try my very, very best to be a person of my word. That if I say I'm going to do something, unless there is something that prevents that or impedes that, and I may have to alter that or change my plans or say something to you, but at the very least, if I say I'm going to do something, I try my very best to do it. I know some people don't care about that. They have no integrity. They just say things, and they have no intention of keeping the word. And so when people say, I didn't have time, I found this out, sis, that it's not that they didn't have time. They just didn't prioritize you. It's not that they didn't have time. They had time to do something else. They had time to go to the store. They had time to go on the phone. They had time to scroll through Facebook. It's not that people don't have time for you. It's that they don't prioritize you. Ain't nobody that busy. Ain't nobody that busy. You saw the phone come up. You saw the text. You saw the message. It's not they didn't have time. It's just that you decided that this was more important than that. And that's okay when it comes to me. I'm just a man. But the problem is we also do that with God. God wants to be a priority. 
He doesn't want to be second and third after you've done other things, after you spent your energy going after other stuff, and you keep thinking you're going to play God by making him a side chick. You think you're going to get God's blessing by putting him as an afterthought. You think you're going to get God's favor by putting him on the back burner, and God said, I will not be played, sir. I will not be played, ma'am. Either I'm going to be God of all, Lord of all, or I won't be Lord at all. Can y'all handle this on a Sunday morning? I want to be Lord in your life. I want to be God in your life. I want to be the Lord of your life. And why do you keep calling me Lord, Lord, and you don't do the things that I say? You are split, sir. You are divided. You are schizophrenic. And I don't believe you. I was sharing with the ministers on yesterday. We were training with them. Give God praise for our MITs. I spent some time with them on yesterday and I shared with them there's a psychological disorder where people are uh, drawing people to them and pushing people away at the same time. It's a psychological disorder where you're doing this with people with the one hand and doing this with people with the other hand. And many of us, our relationships with people are impacted because you're confusing us. On the one hand, you're saying, come in, love me. Be with me. But when they come, you're saying, get away from me. Get back. I don't want you. And that frustration will drive people away, good people away, good volunteers away, good members away. It'll drive good romantic relationships away. Ain't nobody got time to be trying to figure you out. Do you want me or not? Come see me. Call me. Check on me. Then I come. Get back. Get away. Get up. Some of you are divided in your commitments to your church. Am I going to be here? Am I going to be there? And neither pastor is getting the best of your gifts. On the one hand, I want you to come, come, come. On the one hand, I want you to go, go, go. Figure out what you want. Figure out what you want to do. Prioritize. Figure out what's important and place things in their place of importance. There are some things that are equally important, but there are some things that have to be done first. And God says, I want to be first. I want to be your priority. I want to be the first thing on your list. The first person you talk to. The first person you consult before you do anything. In our text, Haggai was sent to preach to a people who had, get this, misplaced priorities. And let me give you some context. Around 586 B.C., because of their idolatry, God allowed the nation of Babylon to invade Judah and to conquer his people. Basically, he put them on a timeout. He put them on a timeout as a punishment for repeated disobedience. As they insisted on making idols their gods, worshiping false idols, not respecting God not putting him in his proper place of importance. After repeated prophecies warning them about it, God finally said, I've had it. And he sent the Babylonians to punish them, to put them basically in a timeout. Let me tell you what happened. Nebuchadnezzar and the soldiers of the Babylon army destroyed the capital city of Jerusalem. They captured the citizens of that city and they deported them. Some of them had to walk hundreds of miles into slavery. And here, here's what you folks' attention on right here. The holy temple, the place of their worship, their source of identity and pride was robbed and burned. Not only did they lose the city, not only did they lose their freedom, but they lost the thing that they took the most pride in. That was Solomon's temple. It was the absolute center of their faith. Solomon's temple in particular had great significance to them. Solomon's temple was symbolic of God's presence dwelling in the midst of his people. People from all over the world came to see Solomon's temple. It was magnificent. It was glorious. It was grand. It was awe-inspiring. And all kinds of people from all over the world came to see this great temple that was dedicated to the God of Israel. 
The queen of Sheba, when she came, she was so impressed that it <gasps> took her breath away. Ooh, took her breath away to walk into the church. And listen, it wasn't the size of the structure that impressed her. It wasn't the dimensions of the structure that impressed her. The Bible said when she saw the order of the service, when she saw how well they did what they did, when she saw how they operated in a spirit of excellence, when she saw how they went up, and look at this, when she saw how happy the workers were, it took her breath away. It took her breath away. To think that somebody could walk into your church and all over this ministry right now, we're talking to our leaders, we're talking to our volunteers, we're talking to our staff about doing things on a certain level of excellence because it wasn't the building that impressed them. It was how happy the people were and how organized they were. You will not bring glory to God being disorganized and living in disarray. You will not bring glory to God being half-baked Half doing stuff, doing stuff erratically in any kind of way. The queen of Sheba had seen temples before. She was a queen. She had money. She had a kingdom. She had a house. That was what impressed her. What impressed her was how orderly they were, and they was happy about it. Ain't nothing worse than coming to an institution or to a church, and everybody's mad. The musicians are mad. The ushers are mad. The choir is mad. They sing mad. <laughs> They usher mad. <laughs> they play the instruments mad. The preacher preached like he mad. Everybody's just mad. Y'all know what I'm talking about. There are some people who have great institutions, and though it's impressive on the outside, when you get closer to it, you realize people are not happy there. The turnover rate is so high in some of these organizations and churches and companies. Though they're doing great on the NASDAQ, to work for them is hell. Though they're being impressive, amen, on the stock market, to work for them, it is not one of the best places to work. They mistreat people. They disrespect people. They down people. They degrade people. They don't know how to talk to people right. They don't know how to treat people right. And you cannot go forward not treating people right. So she was impressed. Woo! These people are happy about it. They serve and happy in a breath. But here's what's even greater. When Solomon erected his temple, he prayed. He said, Lord, I want this to be a place. This place that I built for you is going to be a place where all the peoples of the earth will know that your name is great and they will respect you. This is 1 Kings 8, 43. And he will recognize and they will recognize that your name, your name is attached to this house. I'm going to be talking about this temple all service long. So if you don't get that right there, you're going to miss the whole subject. The temple, the place, the house of God where the glory of God was, he said people from all over the world are going to see this house because your name is attached to this house. Can I go deeper? On the day of the dedication of the temple, fire fell from heaven. When he offered up sacrifices, Fire came from heaven, which was God saying, I'm pleased with this sacrifice. And the glory of God filled the temple so strong that the priest couldn't even minister. The glory of God fell in that place so strong that the priests fell out. The singers couldn't sing and the ushers couldn't usher and the priests couldn't serve. Oh, for the time, for the day that the glory of God will hit his church to the place that we can't even stand to minister. Oh, for the day that the glory of God come into our church so strong that the musicians have to jump off the instruments because the worship is so strong. Oh, for the day that the glory of God come in and the singers forget their notes because they can't even get away from the glory of God. I was singing, but the power of God came in so strong that I'm overwhelmed and I'm on my face and we're trying to go to the next thing, but the glory is so strong. Oh my God, y'all don't miss that. Y'all don't miss that. But I miss the day where the glory would come in so strong that the preacher couldn't even preach and not because he didn't have a word. Some of y'all preach because you ain't got a word anyway. But I'm talking about when God comes in so strong that you can't put your words together and your notes begin to disappear. 
and your mouth begins to get dry because God's glory is here so strong that you can't even stand in his presence. Ooh, somebody lift your hand and say, Lord, come on in my house. I miss now we're talking about a temple, but let me talk about your temple. Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost that dwells in you? When was the last time that you allowed the Holy Ghost in you to overwhelm you so strong that you couldn't even get yourself to go? Have you ever had a glory fall on you on your way to work, Connie, and you almost wrecked your car? Have you ever had a glory come on you while you typing at work that you got to step away from the computer and go into the bathroom and get along with God? Have you ever had a glory fall on you so strong while you're washing dishes that soap suds start going everywhere because the glory... Y'all come to church looking for a glory, but I'm talking about having a personal relationship with God where the glory shows up in your living room, in your kitchen, on your couch, while you're watching TV. Out of nowhere, your hands just go up in the air because the glory, oh, y'all don't, y'all don't know what I'm talking about. No choir, no preacher, no band, no musicians, no nothing, just a raw glory of God that comes in and makes you fall on your knees because you sense all of a sudden that God is here. Oh, is there anybody that knows that God is here? He's in the room. Slap somebody and say, God is here. Yeah. The temple, the temple, the temple, the temple, the temple, the temple, the temple is the place where they got all their, their teachings and their trainings in the house. In the house. They lost houses. They lost personal houses. But none of that was in comparison to losing the house of God. The house of God was where I got teaching, training, instruction. All the religious practices were a tithe. It was a very site specific, right? It was at the temple where they brought their sacrifices. They followed very rigid patterns. There, there were certain sacrifices that could only be done at the temple. I've got a personal relationship, a personal walk with God, but there were certain things that could only be performed at the temple proper. For example, on the Day of Atonement, when the priest went into the holiest of holies and began to for the sins of the people that couldn't be done just anywhere it was a specific place and a specific spot that God said bring your offering here come to this place at this time God specific come to this place at this time wear this kind of garments and stand in my presence and if you do it I will give peace to your people you couldn't just do that anywhere that had to be at the temple the temple was important to maintain their relationship their connection with God Because of sin, all that was gone. All that was gone. The Babylonians came in and they snatched all the valuable stuff, the gold, the silver. They even snatched the holy things. When God created the tabernacle and the temple, there were certain items that were set aside for the use of God only. Couldn't nobody use them for nothing. Look at the disrespect that they came in and took the holy things and snatched them and took them off to Babylon. No respect for the holy things. And I'm concerned that in this age that we are dealing with people who have no respect for holy things. Anytime you have people who will come right into a church and shoot people and rob people and cuss people out and be disruptive right in the house of God, just soon cuss you out, not outside, not across the street, not at the liquor store. They'll come right up in the house of God. They have no respect for holy things. They have no respect for holy people. They have no respect for people that God has his hands on. God says over and over, touch not my anointed, neither do the prophet no harm. He wasn't just talking about the pastor. I'm talking about the people in the pews. You are a child of God. She is a child of God. He is a child of God. How dare you disrespect with your mouth and with your slander and with your words the things that God has called holy. 
but they did. They snatched those holy things out of the temple, just snatched them, treat them any kind of way, and they burned it down. So now the temple, my God, the place where the glory fell, the place where the power of God went forth was now empty and burned and broken. And a broken temple was symbolic of a broken relationship with God. A broken temple was symbolic of their relationship with their God. It was broken down. Without the temple proper, they had no system of worship, no way to connect with God properly. See, 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 I see, I gotta paint the picture for you. See, in the temple, there was praise and prayer going up 24 hours a day. 24 hours a day. There were sacrifices being made. There were sacrifices going up. The smoke of those sacrifices was going up. But at the same time, there was praise going up. It was praise and sacrifice and sacrifice and praise. And the smoke of the sacrifice went up at the same time that the sound of the praise went up. And all that mixed in together and went up into the nostrils of God as a sweet smelling savor. Oh, my God. 24 hours a day. They were singing and sacrificing at the same time singing and sacrifice and sacrifice and singing and praising and prayer and praise and sacrifice was all going on at the same time 24 hours a day can you imagine can you imagine Adrian 24 hours a day that means they had shifts they had shifts there was always something going on there was either singing or rehearsing Serving or getting ready to serve. 24 hours a day. Any time of day you came by, there was something going on in the temple. Some song was going up. Some praise was going up. And I walked, the closer I got to the temple, I could smell the sacrifice and I could hear the song. Ooh. 24 hours a day. If I woke up at 2 o'clock in the morning, I could smell and see the smoke going up. And I could hear the praises going at the same time. But now it's gone. No sacrifices. No praises. Shh. It was eerily quiet. God was Ichabod. Gone. Empty. Broken down. Nobody here at one time. It was so full in the house of God. You couldn't find a seat. They had to have shifts because you all couldn't get at the same time. And now... Foxes running through the building. Weeds growing up. Sound is gone. Because the people of God were snatched away from their system of worship. And were slaves in Babylon. And to make matters worse. They mocked them by saying. Sing us the songs of Zion. In a strange land. Yeah. This is smart. You know. Sing us a song. They was trying to make him out of a minstrel. Uh-huh. Sing us a song. Sing us the songs you used to sing in church. They was doing a mockery. Sin will make a clown out of you. Sin will clown you. And you think that you're getting with people who are criticizing the church. Siding with people who are criticizing the church. Putting your thoughts into it. Yeah, that's right. Church ain't nothing. Preachers ain't nothing. Ain't nobody nothing and all that kind of stuff. And you don't understand that they're making a mockery out of you. This was the place that you got delivered, that you got saved, that you got set free. This was the place that God drew you out of drugs, drew you out of poverty, changed your mind. And how dare you now side with people who disrespect the thing that set you free. Sing, church. Sing. A minstrel show. To which they responded, Adrian, how can we sing the songs of God in a strange place? How? I can't even find. Does anybody know what it's like to be so grieved, to be so depressed that you can't even sing a song? I, I can't even find a song. You know songs lift your spirits. 
Songs will sometimes bring you up when you're down. Songs will sometimes help you get through a moment. That's why when they had the civil rights movement, they always had these songs that were attached to it. Because sometimes songs will help you make it through a bad place. But has anybody ever been so depressed, so down, so frustrated, so trodden down, so grieved in your spirit that I can't even find a song? How can we sing the song of the Lord in a strange place? And somebody in this room right now, you're in a strange place. You're in a strange place. You're not quite here and you're not quite there. You're not as committed as you used to be. You're not as prayerful as you used to be. You're in church. You're at church, but church is not in you. You're in a strange place and you're trying to sing on the praise team from a strange place. You're trying to minister the gospel from a strange place. You're trying to put on a front and a face for people and put on a smile and a mask for people. But really, Pastor, I'm in a strange place. I'm not quite here and I'm not quite there. I know I should be here. I know I should be happy, but I'm not quite happy. I feel schizophrenic. I feel isolated in a room full of people like this. I still feel lonely because I'm in a strange place. People are hugging on me, but I don't feel no love because I'm in a strange place. You can be married and be in a strange place. You're not going to talk to me today. You could be laying in the bed next to somebody and still be in a strange place. I'm with you, but I'm not with you. We're together, but we're not together. You can be preaching and serving and being in a strange place. I'm here, but I'm not here. My body's here with you, but my mind is on the other side of town. And that's the way many people are in church. My body is here. I'm sitting on a pew. I'm waiting for you to finish your sermon, but my mind is on the roast in the oven. On what happened last week, on what I'm dealing with, and I'm in a strange place. And this is where they lived for years. It's an overnight thing. It was at least a half a century that they stood in this place. I'm going to talk to somebody who's been going through depression for a long time. We all get down sometimes. We all have issues sometimes. We all go through things sometimes. But I want to talk to somebody who's been going through it for a long time. Unemployed for a long time. Lonely for, see, I can be lonely for a couple days. But I'm talking about somebody who's been lonely for a long time. Sick for a long time. Broke for a long time. And after a while, when you start going through things, it starts to wear on you. It wears on your spirit. It wears on your mind. It's, it's, it's where it starts showing on you physically. See, I can fake it for a little while. You would never know what I'm going through. But if you go through something long enough, what's happening on the inside starts showing up on the outside where you don't care how you look, you don't care if your shoes match your socks, you don't care if your hair done or not, you don't care if you're white, you don't even care. Has anybody ever gotten to a place where I just didn't care? Jimmy cracked corn, and I don't care. I just don't care. I don't care. I don't care. I show up. To, I used to show up to work fly, make sure everything was put together. Right now, I'm going through so much, I don't even care. I don't care. I don't care. And I'm trying to talk to somebody right now who has gotten in a space spiritually where you just don't care. Where life has beat you down to a place where it doesn't matter to you. You don't care. You don't care about anything. You are despondent. And the things that used to get, and you know you're in a bad place because the things that used to give you joy don't give you joy anymore. Your loved ones, your job, your people, your husband, your spouse, whatever, whatever, those things you get joy about. And now those things get on your nerves. You know why? Because I'm in a bad place spiritually. And some of you are trying to mask what's happening with you spiritually with stuff. You're trying to mask where you are spiritually with getting expensive hairdos and expensive suits and expensive cars and expensive homes, trying to mask the grieving in your spirit and your soul. And you wonder why you're not happy. You got more stuff, but you don't have more God. 
I'm getting more dates. I'm getting more attention, but I'm getting less me. After a while, all the dinners look the same. After a while, all the restaurants look the same. After a while, they all start looking the same. And I'm back in the same place of being depressed. How can we sing the Lord's song? How can we sing? S some people, you can tell in their worship that they're in a bad place. If you're a spiritually discerning person, it's, it's, it's a sound, Adrian. It's just something. It's not what they say. It's something in the way they say it that lets you know that I'm in a bad place. Yeah. Have you ever been in church but been in a bad place? Yeah. In the midst of the praise, in the midst of the shouting, in the midst of the celebration, but I'm in a bad place. So I can't hardly get off it. Lord, help me. I'm in a bad place, Pastor. I would volunteer, but I'm in a bad place right now. I would show up. I would come, but I'm in a bad place right now. Have you ever been in a place where even the people that are closest to you don't even know how to fix you? Where you don't, where you're married to somebody and they're such in a bad, you don't even know what to say. What do I, I can't fix it. How do I, how do I get them out of it? You want them to be okay. Have you ever lost someone that you love or a spouse lost someone that they love and you can't find the right words to say to pull them out of this place. And there they sat in a place for over half a century, weeping, hanging their harps on the willow tree because now they were spiritually broken. But finally, finally, ah, there's a good side to the story. Finally, after living in exile for that long, God raised up a Persian king by the name of Cyrus. And Cyrus conquered the Babylonians, the people that had conquered them. They beat the Israelites, the Persians beat them. And one of the things he did was he gave a decree allowing the Jewish people to return to their homeland. What, get this now, get this, with the purpose of rebuilding their temple. To reestablish, to reinstate, to restore the order of worship. Look at the grace and the mercy of God who says, whatever you lost, I'm going to give it back. Come on, somebody. I've lost time, I've lost money, I've lost relationships, but God is not going to always leave you down, that God will make you get back everything you lost. Somebody ought to be glad about that right there. I've been in a place a long time, I've been unemployed for a long time, I've been lonely for a long time, I've lost a whole lot of stuff, but God is faithful. Even when I'm not faithful, God is still faithful, and God will still bless you to get back everything you lost. Find you about three people that say you're going to get it all back, you... You're not talking big enough for me in here. You're not saying it loud enough. Find somebody else and say, you're going to get it all back. Your praise back, your dance back, your joy back, your celebration back. God is going to build it back. Everything, don't get depressed about what you lost. God said everything you lost, and you're going to get it back. Take 30 seconds and give God a shout. If you know God's going to get it back. I got to run. I got to run. Praise was going to be the priority. When praise becomes your priority, God will make you get it all back. They were released to go back to their home and build their temple, reestablish, look, the worship. But look what happened. Number one, write this down. Discouragement. The moment they got there, the people that lived there opposed the work and they became discouraged, and they left the work unfinished. Can you imagine sitting in exile, sitting in a place for, for, for over 50 years, suddenly the door springs open, you can go home now, you can go back to church now, you can go back, you've been shut down, you've been locked in, you've been held down, now you can go back to your churches, and we thought erroneously, Adrian, that everybody was going to come running back to church. And a few people did. And the few that came got discouraged by the many that did not. <laughs> and so they got discouraged. And see, you have to realize this. Anytime you make a quality decision to change your life, expect opposition. Don't be shocked. Opposition and opportunity are twins that often walk in the door together. 
Oh, God, I'm throwing bombs. Y'all, I hope y'all writing this stuff down. I said opportunity and opposition are twins who often walk in the door together. And a lot of people forfeit their opportunity because they can't take the opposition. You think that if it's God, it's going to be easy. It's going to come without struggle. It's going to come without problems. But I come to warn somebody that in this world, you shall be blessed, but it will come with a struggle. And some people forfeit their opportunity because they can't take the opposition. It's not that they don't want the opportunity. I want to be married. I want to start a job. I want to have a ministry. I want to go for my career. I want to have these kids. But it's the problems that come with it that make me forfeit my opportunity. What am I saying? Some people just can't stand to be blessed. What that one rapper used to say? More money, more problems. Some of y'all want more money, but with more money, sometimes come more problems. Y'all not going to talk to me. And somebody sold you on the idea that if you get saved, give your life to Jesus, get the Holy Ghost, that you'll never have problems in church and never have problems with people. And so there you were clapping your hands and you ran into problems and you left your church, you left your God, you left your position because you erroneously thought that just because you were blessed, yet you wouldn't have problems. Look at somebody and say, that's normal. Watch discouragement. There are a lot of gifted people who have left, backslid, went back to the world because of discouragement. Because they didn't realize that the more blessed you are, you become a target. That when you make a decision to walk with God, you get on the devil's hit list, you become a target. As long as you sat down in Babylon crying and feeling sorry for yourself, you didn't have no problem. But the moment you start to pull yourself together, get yourself together, get your money together, get your life together, get your kids and your marriage together, all kind of criticism, opposition, problems begin to confront you. Problems is not a sign that you're not doing the wrong, not doing the right thing. Sometimes problem is a sign you are doing the right thing. Can I talk to you this morning? Look at somebody and say, keep on doing the right thing. Here's the thing about doing the right thing, Charlene. Sometimes doing the right thing don't feel good. Sometimes doing the right thing just don't feel good. Why is it that I'm doing the right thing, but I don't feel as good about it? Because of opposition. If, if, if doing the right thing made me a millionaire, I'd be happy about it. But sometimes doing the right thing will get you kicked out of places, talked about, ostracized, criticized, looked at funny. And some people, they want the blessing, but they can't take the opposition. They couldn't take the heat, so they got out the kitchen. And so you left the blessing because you couldn't take somebody rolling their eyes at you. The devil is a lie. Roll your eyes, pop your neck, run your mouth, pop your gums. I'm going to stand right here and receive what God has for me. If that's you, jump up on your feet and say, I'm going to stay right here. Hold on. Number two. Let's talk about distraction. Our position led to discouragement and discouragement led to distraction. Understand this, that when the first wave came out of exile, it was about 50,000 of them, and most of them were skilled workers. When they, went, when they were sent back home, most of them were skilled workers. They had specialized skills. They were builders. They came with tool belts on. They came prepared to build the place of worship. They were gifted. They were anointed. They were, play, they were trained to do the things of God. Just like some of us, there are some people that God has sent to this church specifically to help us build. You are a builder. You've always been a builder. Every place you went, you were a builder. Every place you served, you were a builder. Everywhere God called you, you're a builder on your job. They pay you money to solve problems. You are a builder. But when they got over there and got opposition, they got distracted. It's a bad thing when the builders get distracted. 
I was, I was having some work done one time on my house. I had a project being done. And it got on my nerves that the contractors get distracted. This is what you do. How you going to get this? I paid you to build something, to do something, and now you won't get distracted. <laughs> I had a housekeeper one time, Adrian, and I, I hired them to, I was trying to uh, surprise my wife for her birthday, and I, and I hired a housekeeper to just clean the whole house, right? I was just going to surprise. First time I ever did it, I said, I'm going to hire a housekeeper, and this is going to be my gift, and they ain't got to do anything. You ain't got to wash no dishes. You ain't got to do no clothes. You ain't got nothing. Just come and clean the house. And they, this is what they do. Child, I come in there watching TV. They watching the soap operas. I hired you to do a job. How are you going to get distracted with what J.R. Ewing was doing on Dallas? Wait a minute. But that's how some of us are. Do you know that God has gifted you to bring your gifts and talents to the house? See, see, see when you're a builder, you have to build. It's just in you. It just depends on what you're working on that matters. When you're a builder, it doesn't matter where I put my hand. If I'm a builder, I'm a builder on my job. I'm a builder at my house. I'm, that's just what I am. That's what I do. If you put me in any situation, I come in with a tool box belt, tool belt on prepared to work. And there are some people who are gifted by God so that when they show up on the scene, they come in asking, what can I do? They don't come to church saying, what can my church do for me? They come in saying, what can I do for my church? You are immature, sir. You are immature, ma'am, in your walk with God if you always come in with your hands out asking what can you get rather than what can you give. Ooh, face that. I didn't think it was going to come down this hard, sis. Yeah, yeah, you coming with your hand out saying what can it do for me? And if it doesn't do something for you, then you're ready to leave when in reality, God is saying, I want to get something out of you. So these, these workers came and they were distracted. Other, now listen, it's not that they stopped building. They just built other things. Other things took priority. You follow where I'm going here? They were sent home to build the temple. They got discouraged. They got distracted. They didn't stop building. They just stopped working on the temple. The spirituality the place of worship lost its place of priority. And this is what they did, sis. They were still building homes, <laughs> opening stores, doing commerce. Fields were planted. Crops were harvested. They were working on everything except God's house. Everything except the temple. Everything was going up. Everything was being erected. Everything was going on as usual except God's house. God's house sat in disrepair. They were busy building their own houses while the house of God sat in ruins. They were busy making sure their stuff, their business was going up. They were busy trying to build their lives and their careers while the house of God was falling down. Ooh, how can you walk past, right past God's house and see all the things need to be done on your way to your job? Oh my goodness. Come on. on your way to your business. Every day walking by, weeds were growing up. Foxes were running all through it. The place where the glory of God was falling, the place where God's name was. Ooh. This was the place where God's name was. And I've got so busy, I'm distracted. And it's lost this place of importance. The, the, the temple had lost its relevance to them. That's what it was. It lost its importance. People just didn't see the necessity. They didn't see it as a necessary part of their life. They didn't see God's house, God's temple, God's worship as a necessary part of their lives. Don't that sound like us today? They, they, they have been away so long, sis, that they just got used to not going. I got used to it. Kind of reminds me of us coming out of the pandemic. That some people have been out so long and realized, they say, you know, we don't need church. We don't need church. We don't need a preacher. We don't need a place of worship. It's not important. It has lost its relevance to us. It's not important. I hear people arguing right now saying church has lost its relevance. It is antiquated. 
It has no place in modern society. That's what they argue. And this is what they argue with him. They said, it's not time yet to build the Lord's house. That was their argument. Verse 2. They said, it's not time. We have been locked down for over 50 years. We couldn't do what we wanted to do, go where we wanted to go. And now we're free. It's time to turn up. Turn up. Ain't nobody trying to go to church. Ain't nobody trying to be a sacrificial and consecrated and showing up and building no temple. It's time to turn up. Yeah, turn up, turn up. Get my business going. Hey, get my hair done. Hey, I'm going to sports games. I'm doing all these things. They argue it's not time to build the Lord's house. It ain't time for all that. Trying to get my business going. Trying to get my internet business going. My e-commerce going. Man, I've been stuck in this house all this time. I got to call some people back so I can go on a few more dates. There's some restaurants I need to go to. There's some sports games I miss. Hey, hey, look, they ran back to the football games and ran right past the church. Turn up. <laughs> Turn up. <laughs> Verse 4, Hagar says, <laughs> Hagar says, is it time for you to live in your ceiling house, your panel house, your luxury houses while the house of God sits in ruins? He said, is it time for you to turn up while God's house is going down? Jesus. Y'all look tight. <laughs> The temple represented their spiritual condition. And I'm asking somebody right now, while you're trying to get more stuff, you have ignored your spiritual condition. You got your hair did, but you're putting nothing in your head. You get your pockets fat, but you're putting nothing in your spirit. You're increasing your circle of influence and friends, but you have not gotten closer to your God. And the spiritual condition of your spiritual house is in decay. Because you want to turn up. Turn up. Hey, we party it. Hey, Earth, Wind, and Fire is here. I'm going to Earth, Wind, and Fire concert. I ain't got time for Bible class. I ain't got time for worship. I ain't got time to serve. I ain't got time to minister. I ain't got time to preach. I ain't got time for prayer. Because I got to... Th- Talking about turn down for what? Turn down for what? Because your spirit is dying. And you don't notice it because you're so enamored with your new car. You don't notice it because you're enamored with the zero showing up in your bank account. You don't notice it. And what's happening gradually is your spiritual de- condition is declining. So you got more stuff, but you have less power. Mm. And what made it worse, Adrian, it didn't bother them that the church was in that condition. It didn't bother them. That's what I'm concerned about today. It didn't bother them. It's not that it was bad, but it didn't even bother you. It doesn't even bother you that you don't have enough prayer life to even rebuke a headache. It doesn't bother you that you can't cast out demons out of your child. It doesn't bother you that 50% of marriages and churches are failing. It doesn't bother you that your children are not following behind you in your faith, but they're running straight to the clubs and to the streets. It don't bother you. It don't bother you. It don't bother you. It's Halloween time. It doesn't bother you that they're setting up locations all over the city to have fright night and demon night and all these kind of things going on. And those places are packed while our churches are empty. That should bother you. We're going to turn up, though. We're going to turn up. It didn't bother them, but it did bother God. And because of their unfaithfulness and their lack of priority, God called for a drought. I'm going to get your attention. One of Haggai's favorite words throughout these whole few verses is he used the word consider. Consider this. Consider that. Consider means to refocus. Place your attention. Pay 
attention. Look at what's happening here. Look at this. You didn't get as good as you thought. You weren't doing as good as you thought. Verse, verse, verse six. You planted much and harvested little. You ate, but you ain't full. You drinking, but you ain't happy. Oh, God. Ah. You, you're putting on clothes, but you're not satisfied. This is for people that are finally realizing that the more stuff I get, it's not making me happy. I thought if I got a bigger house, I'd be happy. I'm not. I thought if I could be a more expensive car, and here's the worst thing. Those of you who are working, those of you who do have businesses, you are like somebody who is putting your money in a bag with holes in it. If you got a bag with holes in it, no matter how much you put in, you're not keeping it. It's going right out. What am I saying, Pastor? I'm saying your investments are not yielding like you thought. There's no return on what you've been doing. You're working more hours. But even with the hours that you're working, your income is not keeping up with the rate of inflation. You think it's the devil. It ain't the devil. It's God saying, I'm trying to get your attention. Lest you be distracted with trying to get stuff. You're putting stuff instead of me. And I'm jealous. And so what I did was I... I blew on it. You didn't put your money in church. You put it in some kind of investment and you thought it was going to make a return. And now your returns are going down because you invested in the wrong thing. Oh God, get me out of here. You're about to lose your mind watching the stock market every day because you thought that Bitcoin was going to be the answer. Took almost your whole entire savings and threw it into it. And you like to have a heart attack. Jesus. Wow. <laughs> Come on. Because instead of prioritizing where you put your energies and your monies in me, you put it in it. And I am a jealous God. And anytime you worship it, whether you worship me, I'm going to blow on it. So God said I blew on it. Jesus. This ain't the devil. This is your decisions. Some of the stuff you call the devil is not the devil. It's your decisions. There's a reason why that woman is not responding to you. Because you were more interested in what the sports game were doing. You wanted to hang with the boys. You wanted to run the street and wonder why you're not receiving a return. Don't come to me for counseling. It's about your decisions. This ain't the devil. This ain't no devil. I rebuke you right now. This ain't no devil. This is about your decisions. Life is about decisions. My brother, life is about decisions. My sister, life is about decisions. And you will reap the consequences of your decisions. If you honor God, he will honor you. If you disrespect God, he will disrespect you. All right, I'm just trying to, I'm just saying. How else can you explain that you're working more hours and you're working overtime and you're working under time and you still have not kept up with the rate of inflation? God said, I ordered a drought. I'm trying to get your attention. And I knew if I hit your pocket, I'd get your attention. Don't nothing get your attention like money. Oh, you can say anything you want to say. You hit them pockets, baby. I'm like, huh, what? What you say, God? Well, <laughs> Look at my, he got my attention. Look at my, say, he got my attention now. You, you got my attention now. I started my business. I celebrated. I had dedication. I had a big old party and a grand thing. And I started disrespecting God. I was less and less at church and less and less at Bible class. I invested more time in it than I did in you, God. And I have to repent because this became my God instead of you becoming my God. And I became a slave to the income instead of being a slave to your spirit. And the love of money has opened me up to all sorts of evil but I want to change my heart God and put my love back on you so that I can be in a place somebody wants to be in a place give God a praise right here I gotta get my I gotta get my priorities right I got ah. 
But I want to tell somebody that the switch is in your hand. My third point, you got to make a decision. Here's what they said, verse 8. Now go up to the hills and get lumber and rebuild the temple. If you want to stop this drought, rebuild the temple. If you want to stop the foolishness that you are reaping in your life, rebuild the temple. Rebuild your relationship. Rebuild your prayer life. Rebuild your study life. Get down on your knees. Carve out some time for God. Put down that phone and get in your Bible. Close the Facebook and get in the book. And God said, if you do that, I will be honored in this place. Oh, my God, Lord. Go up to the hills, get lumber. Rebuild the temple. That I will be pleased and get this so that I can be worshipped, verse 8, as I should be. Is it possible that the reason souls are not being won, that they're not being saved, is because you have not lifted up Jesus? You lifted up your money, you lifted up your car, you lifted up your jewelry, you lifted up the size of your house, but you have not lifted up Jesus. And the Bible says, if I be lifted up, that I will draw all men to me. I didn't need to get saved to get a house. I had a house before I got saved. I didn't need to get saved to get a car. Some of these drug dealers drive better cars than you do. They don't need to see your bling. They need to see your God. I want to be worshipped and respected as I should be. Is it possible that your lack of priority and your emphasis on your spiritual life is causing God to be disrespected? If you don't want to go to church and you don't want to worship, why should I? If you don't respect your God, then why should I? If you see no need for him in your life and you say that you're a Christian, then why should I prioritize him in my life? So here was the challenge. Go stop what you're doing. Pause. Stop what you're doing and go and build my house. Go build your spiritual temple. Go build your spiritual life. If you build your spiritual life, I will cause favor and blessings to come and overtake you. And instead of you chasing it, it will chase you. I'm in the wrong church. I'm in the wrong church. I'm in the wrong church. I'm in the way wrong church. Notice, oh, God, I got to go. Notice, notice how God makes the connection between his goals and your goals. Are you with me? His priorities and your priorities. Notice how God attached his house to your house. His dream of having a temple where he's glorified with your dream. We have financial goals that this church needs to meet. Over the next 90 days, there are some things that we have committed to do. And they're not new things. They're just things that we tabled and we weren't quick to go back to. We have not had any financial campaign, any giving campaign or anything like that since I've been here. Because my focus has been on the spiritual development of God's people. Winning souls. Changing lives. And even when people were doing other things and not coming to church, our commitment to changing lives has remained strong. But ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you something. We are at a crossroad. We are at a place where we need to have some things done. There are some capital improvement things that we need to do. There are some things we need to do, for example, in our children's ministry area, where we're committed to the development and training of our children. There are some safety issues. There are some things that are aesthetically incorrect that we need to fix so that God can be glorified. 
they make it plain. So that when people come and they visit and your children and your grandchildren, you can put them in a safe place that they don't have to worry about the roof falling in on them. Or the AC not working and it being too cold, it'll be too hot. Or the heat not working and it being too cold. Because there are some things, some operational things that we need to get done. And you may not notice it because you know why? Because I focus your attention right here. And I get up here and I clap my hands and I shout and I dance this and we have a good old time and we have church and we go home. But when we go out the door, there are things that we are dealing with behind the scenes that have to be addressed. We are in a space right now where if you don't improve your social media presence, you are almost non-existent. That people access us through the internet. We are challenged. When our praise team sings, you can't even hear how gifted they are because half the microphones don't work. Can I be transparent? They be rearing back singing. Yeah, you can't hear them. Because we need improved microphones. We're trying to make sure that when people access our ministry, that they're not turned off because they can't hear us. Some people that access us, things go down. The social media go down. You know, there's nobody to work the internet. We got a volunteer trying to be downstairs and upstairs at the same time. We need to staff it so that we can make sure we have a strong internet presence that ministers to the world. There are some people who get turned off by their ministry, not because of the word, because they can't hear it. I got friends. Was y'all on today? Yeah, we was on. But it didn't come on. Didn't come on YouTube. I tried to hear you on Facebook. Couldn't hear nothing. Sounds off. The sound is bad. Can't hear the music. We're not being ministered to. And we're missing an opportunity. So there are things like we need to have our lights improved. So that people are not turned off by what they see. See, people make a decision about our ministry based on what they see nowadays, sis. It used to be back in the old day, people would actually come and visit your church. Y'all remember that? You have friends and family day, they come and visit the church and they get a chance to feel it and to touch it and say, wow, this is a great church. Now people shop. They don't even come to the church. They shop you online. And they're making a judgment about your ministry and your impact based on what they see online. So if they can't see and they can't hear, then what will draw them? Not just Christians, but unbelievers. Somebody right now is thinking about suicide or their marriage is falling apart or their kids are in trouble and they're trying to find some place to go worship. And when they can't find us, that means we are derelict in our responsibility. We have not made it easy for them. Why? Because we have neglected the house of God while we ran after our own houses. Ooh. And I felt convicted, brother. I felt, I struggled with this message, Adrian, because I want to get up and talk about God wants to bless your business and bless your marriage and find your boo and build your house and build your, I wanted to preach that and God said, no. How are you going to tell them facing to build their careers and not build my house? Priorities. So here's what God told me. In the next 90 days, we are moving into a season of unprecedented blessings and favor. That fall is typically the time of year of harvest. <laughs> Somebody's hearing me. That fall is typically the time when it's time to bring in everything that God has promised to you. That fall is typically the time of year if you're in agriculture when they start bringing in all the stuff that they've planted all year and they begin to get their expectations met. God said some of the things you've been sowing all year, I'm going to cause it to go past your expectations. And the next 90 days are going to be a period of unprecedented blessings because you are making a decision today to put God first. So I want to do two things. Number one, if you're not a Christian in here, would you lift your hand and say, I need to be saved today. You're a backslider. I need to get my life together. I've been wandering around and I need a good church and I want to join this church. If that's you, just wave your hands at me. 
they didn't hear me. And so you that watch me online, don't click off because this is something that I want you to participate in. I want to issue a challenge today. There, there, there's a certain dollar amount that we're trying to raise between now and the first of the year. 90 days. And I want you to participate with me in this 90 days of blessings. So here's what I'm going to do. Here's what I'm going to do. I want to challenge each of you who are in the sound of my voice to sow today some variation of 90. For somebody, it's 900. For somebody, it's 90 dollars. For somebody, depending on where you are, it might be nine dollars. But I'm going to challenge you in this moment to join with me in sowing a seed into rebuilding and restoring God's house. Now, here's what I need from you. Some of you I know weren't prepared to do it, but some of you are. I want you to know that God is saying to you that whatever you make happen for my house, I'll make happen for your house. Oh, God, help me. That if you take a moment and prioritize what I'm trying to do, I'll prioritize what you're trying to do. And see, this is how I want to do this. I want to attach our dream to your dream. How many of you got dreams right now? Thank <laughs> you.